Okay, welcome back. Uh, let's start uh, on the second lecture, which again will be on uh, ground state projection uh, and specifically done uh, for quantum spins in the valence bond basis. Okay, so here uh, the, the review artic article I recommended to you before doesn't really talk about this, but there's a fairly detailed paper that I can recommend if you want to read the details. Uh, but I will also talk about some, some things that are not in this paper, but there will be some other references further along. Okay, so what I will do first, I will uh, talk about the basic principles of ground state projection, including uh, there was a question before, uh, you know, why it converges to the ground state and so on, so I will, uh, you know, talk about that. Uh, then I will discuss the valence bond basis, what it is and uh, some of its properties. Uh, and then uh, how to formulate uh, quantum Monte Carlo in that basis and why that would be a good Id idea. Uh, and then I will again talk about an implementation for the spin one half Heisenberg magnet. And you will actually see that it's very similar to what we already talked about uh, for the stochastic series expansion. Uh, if I have time, I will say a few words about valence bond solids, which are, uh, you know, states of possible states of uh, quantum antiferromagnets. They are basically dimerized states. Uh, and uh, I want to actually discuss how we can use this valence bond basis, not just to study valence bond solids, but also how to discuss the excitations of valence bond solids, which in some way you can uh, see as uh, in terms of spin-ons. So I will illustrate that on 1D systems. And again, uh, there's some program online, uh, same uh, URL as before. You can find a, a little menu there. Uh, and if we have time, I will just maybe show a little bit uh, of the program. <clears throat> okay, project the quantum Monte Carlo. So I already showed this, uh, uh, these equations here. So uh, you, you have uh, some state. You act with some operator which has the property of filtering out, or as we say, projecting out. Uh, the ground state when some parameter becomes large. So you can do a large power of the Hamiltonian or you can do an exponential operator. Those are the most common one. Actually, this name trial state to refer to this yeah. state psi naught, I don't <coughs> really like it so much, but that's what, uh, how it's used. And uh, my understanding is where it comes from is that, uh, you know, time ago people used to not have as powerful numerics and you would take some uh, good variational state uh, and then you did a little bit of some kind of projection and see what you get and it, it's like you try with this state and you try with that state and, and, and you see what gives the best result. So I guess that's where the, the trial state comes from. It's somehow what you try to, to, to start from. But, but the point nowadays, in, at least in the context of what I'm talking about, it doesn't really matter what the trial state is because we will get the correct ground state, you know, no matter what, unless the state has some wrong symmetries or something like that. But anyway, I guess I should use the name trial state because people seem to use that. Uh, okay, so let's look at this trial state expanded into the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Uh, so, since we are going to get the ground state, I, of course, have to assume that the expansion coefficient for the ground state uh, here is not zero. Then, of course, I cannot get the ground state. But, in general, it would be even hard to make such a state unless, you know, this state has the wrong symmetry. Uh, even if you do a random state, it will be, you know, containing some part of the ground state and any kind of state you can cook up normally contains it. And in, in, in what I'm discussing, the choice of this trial state is not so important. Almost anything goes. Although you can do a little bit better if you choose a good one, as I will also show. Okay, so now having our trial state, we act uh, with the power of the Hamiltonian. This is the one where there's a subtlety which was mentioned in this question, so I want to show that one, but you can see that you can do some similar things with uh, the exponential as well. <clears throat> so in, in the basis of eigenstates, these just become numbers, and then you can just shuffle the terms around a little bit and pull out uh, the ground state and just 
you know, I just put a factor in front of it. It doesn't really matter. We don't normally need to worry about the normalization. So this is just basically E0 to the uh, power, uh, you know, whatever power you use times the expansion coefficient in front of it. And then the rest of the terms are here. And now since I pulled out, uh, you know, E0 in front of the whole thing, basically, and, and combined also that into here, there's a ratio of, of uh, uh, energy eigenvalues there. So you see that if this one is the largest in magnitude, uh, then it will converge to the ground state. Oops. So, so that's, that's the condition that uh, E naught absolute value has to be larger than all other ones. <clears throat> and this is often the case even without you know, taking any particular action. And if it's not the case, you can also always subtract some constant from the Hamiltonian and work with that Hamiltonian. Then you, you shift the, the spectrum and, and this can always be true. So th this uh, we can use either with the power of H or the exponential. I will discuss the power of H because that's more similar to, uh, well, actually, if I, if I would do the exponential, you could do something like the stochastic series expansion. If I just do the power of M, I don't need even to worry about the expansion part. Uh, but you can see already that I have powers of H, and we had that uh, last lecture as well. <clears throat> okay, now about the basis that we use. Uh, so we are normally work with the basis of up and down spins, right? Uh, and we are considering the Heisenberg model, which I again write with a diagonal and off-diagonal term like this. Uh, so that's the normal working basis that, that we have, including in the previous lecture. Uh, but there are other bases that people use. For example, we could, uh, if we have a, a system with some uh, highly uh, modulated couplings, let's say couplings are stronger on some bonds, then we could do a dimer expansion uh, around those bonds in some kind of analytical calculation. <clears throat> and we could also use then the basis of uh, uh, singlets and triplets on those bonds. And of course, even if we have completely uniform couplings, that's still a completely valid basis. So we could, in principle, formulate some uh, you know, scheme in that basis, and that can be done. Sometimes it's a good thing to do. Uh, <clears throat> so here we have chosen the bonds where we, for the spin pairs, where we have the singlet and triplets. Uh, and there are singlets and triplets. Uh, and the Hamiltonian is a bit more complicated looking in, in this basis, though. Okay, but the valence bond basis is something else. In the valence bond basis, if we consider a total spin zero state, so a total spin singlet, <clears throat> we can actually only, we only need to work with uh, singlets. So I define a valence bond between to sites as a singlet. Uh, and now again, I, I consider a bipartite lattice. So I have A and B sublattice sites. And I will always think of the first spin as being on sublattice A and the second on sublattice B. OK? <clears throat> so then we can form a state which is a product of singlets in some sort of random uh, fashion. So I just pair my A and B sides up in, in some way uh, into singlets. So this is now representing a product of all these singlets wherever they happen to be. So this is a valence bond basis state. So it's clearly a singlet because all these two spins are, are paired up into singlets. OK? So this basis is overcomplete and non-orthogonal. So it's overcomplete because if you count the number of possible tilings of the lattice like this, it's much, much larger than the number of singlets in the Hilbert space. Uh, I forget how many singlets there are in the Hilbert space, but the number of tilings is, is quite, quite easy because you can think of it as a permutation. So all the A sites, there are N over 
divided by two of them, <coughs> uh, they are connected to some permutation of the B sites. So it's, it, this is just the, the number of, of tilings, and that's larger, I can guarantee you, than uh, the number of singlets in the Hilbert space. So we, uh, but it's over complete, so we can we can at least uh, express any singlet state in uh, in this basis. But because it's over complete, the expansion coefficients are actually not unique. There are many ways to to to, to write such a superposition. But uh, it turns out, <coughs> in some cases, for example, when we are looking at ground states on bipartite lattices, which is what we will be doing, uh, these expansion coefficients can be taken as all positive. And with that restriction, I believe that the, they are actually unique at that point, if, if you re require that they all uh, are positive. Okay, uh, and uh, this is also, in the end, the reason why, why uh, you can do sign problem-free Monte Carlo simulations in this basis because of, of this property. <clears throat> Actually, this property corresponds to, I, I didn't have include a slide on this, but uh, you, you, many of you, I'm sure, have heard about Marshall's sign rule, which is uh, the rule for uh, the sign of the wave function of, of uh, bipartite spin systems, the ground state wave functions. So if you, if you write the ground state in terms of of just up and down spins. <clears throat> so we have some A sites and the rest are B sites. So if, if the wave function or the, the ground state is some, uh, uh, what should I call them, C, C, K. Let me just call them like that, so these refer to up and down states. The sign of this of this coefficient is, you can write it as minus one to the number of up spins on sublattice A. You could also choose down spins or sub sublattice B, it doesn't matter. <coughs> Uh, but that's the uh, that 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 should be the sign of these in the ground state of a bipartite uh, uh, system, and you can see that this actually conforms with that because the first one is all actually uh, let's see I think to to really make it conform to this I should say B here uh, because if the second the second spin is on sublattice B, so if it's up, I get a minus sign. So then you can see that when I tile the whole lat lattice, the sign is exactly this one. <clears throat> so, uh, so this basically is the reason why we can use this basis to study ground states of bipartite lattices, because this conforms with Marshall's sign rule. Okay, so th this basis is quite interesting. It has a lot of neat properties. So let me mention some of them. <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's a non, uh, overcomplete non-orthogonal basis. Actually, all these basis states overlap with each other. And the overlap, you can actually compute quite easily using the overlap graph or what's often called transition graph. So if you have two bond configurations like these, and then you just superimpose them, and then you will see that you form some loops here. In this case, there are three loops, I believe. Yep. <clears throat> uh, so then the overlap is just two to the number of those loops minus n over two. Okay. It's actually quite easy to see because, uh, you know, these bonds are singlets, right? So on each bond, you can have up, down, or down, up. But when you form this transition graph loop, of course, if you have on the red bond up here, down here, then on the black bond, you also have to have down there. Otherwise, they wouldn't overlap. 
uh, and then you would have up here and so on. So on a loop, if you put the spins back in, you have to have this kind of alternating staggered spin configuration. And there are two ways to do that. <clears throat> so you can think of each loop as having uh, two states. Uh, so then the overlap is, is just the number of such states, which is due to the number of loops. And this just comes from the definition of the singlets. Uh, the, the, there's one over square root of, of two in the number of singlets. Okay. Uh, another interesting thing is that you can easily compute some matrix elements. For example, if you want to calculate the spin correlation function, you will need matrix elements between uh, such states. Uh, and there you just again have to look at these loops. So you just have to see is i and j in the same loop, for example, these two, then uh, this matrix element has a well-defined value. If they are in different loops, then uh, it's just zero. <clears throat> and the reason is pretty much the same as here. You see, if, if the spins are on the same loop, then because of this staggered spin configuration on the loop, uh, this will be, uh, this is just this staggered phase factor, actually. Uh, this will be the spin correlation. And if you flip the loop, it doesn't change. The product of uh, S, well, okay. Actually, this is not so easy to see if I write it like that, but if I, if I just consider this one. If I just do the Z component, uh, then you see that you just <clears throat> get some well-defined number if they're on the same loop. But if they're on different loops, then you have to remember that, that uh, this contains all the orientations of the loop. So you have to sum over all the orientations of the loops. And then if you are in different loops, everything will average out to zero. So, so that's why, why this holds. <clears throat> uh, and it turns out that almost anything you, you may want to calculate can be somehow related to, to this loop structure. So you can, this, this paper here has a lot of uh, different results for other types of correlation functions and so on. Okay. Uh, any questions about that? All right. Okay, now how to do project to Monte Carlo in, in this basis? So I uh, list some. His history, there are some papers that consider this. <clears throat> uh, okay, so we have already discussed what, what Projecto Monte Carlo or projectors are doing. We project out from a trial state. And now consider we have, again, uh, a Heisenberg model. And uh, now I, again, want to write the interactions in terms of these, these singlet projectors. So these are singlet projectors. Let me... Let me show that. So this uh, minus so if I act on, uh, okay, so there are two, two sides there. <clears throat> if I have a singlet on those sides, meaning if I have a valence bond on those sides, that's just minus one, right? Because uh, this is minus three quarter on the singlet, and I, I add that, and then there's a, oh, sorry, it's, it's one. Uh, let's see, plus, no, minus one. Okay, and if I act on a triplet, you can easily see that that's zero. <clears throat> so this is a singlet projector, and that's very useful to know in, in this basis. Okay. So what we are going to do now, uh, in a way similar as we did in the SSC, we are going to write h to the n as strings of these operators. And now I'm having these singlet projectors in mind. <clears throat> so, so in this case, I don't divide it up into diagonal and off-diagonal. I just act with these singlet projectors. OK, so what, what can happen when we act on, on a valence bond state? <clears throat> Let's just look at a small piece of a configuration here. So these are, again, my valence bonds. And here I act uh, between 
sides A and B, so that's right on a singlet. So then I, I just get, get one. Uh, and that's because my H, I, J doesn't contain the minus sign there. I have pulled that out. <clears throat> okay, but what happens if I act between two singlets? That's the other thing that can happen, right? Either I, I will act on a singlet or between two singlets. So then you will see what you can actually check this quite easily. I will not uh, do it explicitly here. Uh, so the black ones are the ones I act on. And actually, what are these arrows? Well, the arrows correspond to how I define my singlet, because the singlet has a, a minus sign. So it's up, down, minus, down, up. So I could also define it as down, up, minus, up, down, right? <clears throat> So the arrow, in some sense, can, can correspond to your definition of, of, of the sign. Uh, OK? So if I act between those, what happens is that you actually project a singlet on that bond where you act. Well, that's just from the property of, of that being a singlet projector. <clears throat> and then you actually also make a singlet between those two other sides. So in effect, what you did was to reconfigure those two singlet bonds. You go from one bond configuration to another bond configuration. <clears throat> and luckily, the sign is one half. Sorry, I mean, the, the factor is one half, and there's no minus sign. Uh, OK, and these arrows illustrate, uh, actually, if you do it in detail, how, how the signs change, but you basically get signs that, that cancel out. So basically, what, what this is doing is you start from a valence bond state, and then you do a lot of reconfigurations of these bonds. These bonds, that's, that's what it's doing. Uh, right, OK, in a little while, I will show you that again, for frustrated systems, it doesn't work. In that case, we, we can get some signs there. But for bi bipartite systems, it works. <clears throat> so it, it's always easier to look at some pictures. So here, here I, I show a case where my trial state is just a fixed bond configuration. Uh, and then I have some, some uh, operators acting. So these are the singlet projectors acting. So the first one doesn't do anything because it sits right on a singlet. The second one reconfigures those two bonds. This one reconfigures two bonds. And in the end, after four operations, I have that bond configuration. OK, so now I also want to introduce a, a simple notation here. So it, it, it's just a very long thing to write down this uh, project, projecting string all the time. So I will just call P. Uh, so a string is denoted by P, and formally K is just uh, you know, numbering all the possible uh, strings of operators that I can have. <clears throat> OK, so I have to sum over all possible strings of operators. But now in the shorter notation, that's just summing over PK. OK, right. So when I, when I have done this projection here, I started from a basis state. And then the, the result is some other basis state times some number, which is, you can say, the weight associated with that path. So this is, again, again some kind of path uh, that we are doing. <clears throat> now, in this case, the weight depends very easily on, on these matrix elements that we looked at before. So for a diagonal operation, you just get one. And for an off-diagonal one, you get one half. So the weight is just one half to the number of, of these uh, bond flip uh, of diagonal operations. Very simple. Uh, and in this case, you should notice that there are no what I call dead paths here. So when we did SSE, I pointed out to you that it was important that you only do the legal operations, that there are some, in fact, many operator strings that are not allowed because they would have some illegal operations in them. But in this case, because the base, well, because one of these always happens, there is nothing uh, 
that is illegal here. You can act with your operators anywhere you like, <clears throat> no matter what the state is. Okay. So, but but how do we sample these things? That that's actually not so easy. So initially we did it in a very sort of trivial but inefficient but still okay way, namely just uh, move them at random. So I say here two to four operators, meaning I take that one and move it to some other place at random and same with another one. <clears throat> but the problem with that is that as far as we, can, we know, the only way to calculate the new weight is to completely redo this propagation. You have to uh, propagate it from the beginning. <clears throat> so that takes quite a long, long time. Uh, but because of some nice properties of the valence bond basis, when you evaluate things, it was actually uh, still not that bad. Okay, but now luckily we have some better updating schemes. In fact, as you will see, we, we get more or less exactly the same kind of loop updates that I talked about before in this basis, if we put the spins back in. But for now, let's, let's just consider uh, this way a bit more. <clears throat> well, I will actually not even talk about the sampling, but just how to calculate some things. Uh, so we can actually work in two ways here. We can work with just a wave function, sampling a wave function, uh, or we can sample some expectation values. Actually, let me skip this one because this has to do with just sampling the wave function where the only thing you can really calculate is the energy. So let's just talk about uh, calculating an expectation value. Okay. Uh, so again, I have these, these strings that, that we, we work with. And, uh, but now we have two states. We have to project uh, a bra and a cat state, right? So I do one projection from uh, uh, on the right side. I could call it VR, uh, and eventually that you know, if I if, if I have a high enough power, that should just give me something proportional to the ground state. And then from the left side, I also get the ground state. So by combining Combining these, I, I just do what I need to do for an expectation value in the ground state. <clears throat> and again, it's easier to look at the picture. So here is the right starting state, the left, the bra and the cat. And then we have some random configurations. And what we want to do is to sample them. Uh, and now you see what, what we get here is exactly those overlap or transition graphs as I talked about before. Because when I propagate this state, I get a state here. I propagate that one, I get a state here. And in the end, we, we want to measure something. And that becomes some property of the loops that form when we just superimpose those configurations onto each other. So this is you know, formally what it looks like. It looks a little bit messy, but <clears throat> it's just uh, some weights coming from the propagations uh, and uh, these matrix elements. Well, this is just the overlap. So this is the two to the number of loops things that I mentioned. And up here, it's just uh, uh, those, uh, uh, you check the, the loops, depending on what the operator is, you may just check some property of these loop configurations. OK, but this was, was in the simplest case where, where this state is just a fixed bond configuration. <coughs> And you can imagine that if you think of it as a variational state, that that may not be a very good variational state. Uh, so, but as I mentioned already, it doesn't really matter because if you do this long enough, it it still um, should project out the ground state if if this is the number of operators is large enough. Uh, but there's one one important thing here, namely. Uh, in principle, you can build in some quantum numbers in these states. And actually, we have already built in the spin quantum numbers, the, to the total spin, because we are working with singlets. So if you think about how we project out the ground state from uh, you know, a superposition of, uh, of, of, uh, of states, that superposition in this case is only of singlets. We have completely thrown out from the beginning all higher spin states. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> so that means that the convergence is faster than if we do finite temperature, for example, because in finite temperature, if we go to zero temperature and really want to uh, get rid of all the excited states, we have singlets, triplets, and so on. We have all the spin states. But in this case, we just project out of a singlet, so there are no higher spin states. So that's an advantage. But another thing we can actually do is to build in the momentum of the ground state. So normally in these systems, the momentum is zero in the ground state. <clears throat> and that you can easily, you can easily make a, a state which has zero momentum. So that means that you not only throw out your, your uh, higher spin states, but also the higher momentum states. So if I try to illustrate this again in a, in a different way. So if I just draw all the energy levels I have in the system, I have some ground state, uh, and that normally, actually, in these bipartite systems, almost always the ground state spin is zero, the ground state momentum is zero. And then we have some other states, so this may have S equals 1, K equals, let's say we are in two dimensions, <coughs> pi pi, and so on. You have lots of states here. And they have different momenta and different uh, spins. So if you if you would do a normal project on project or Monte Carlo where you don't build in any special symmetries, then your initial state is some superposition of all these. And when you do your projection, you have to decay them all away. In particular, of course, the one that is going to be the slowest to decay is you know, the first excited state, that's the one which goes away the slowest. <clears throat> okay, but now if you build in, if you use the valence bond basis, then you don't even have that state there because that's a spin one state. So the next singlet may be, you know, up here somewhere. So all this is gone. So your effective, you know, gap, the singlet, singlet gap is typically much larger than the singlet triplet gap. So that improves the convergence. <clears throat> okay, and now if you even, you know, fix the momentum, you may even, uh, I don't know, this may even have some other momentum, let's say this is k equals pi over two, then you have also thrown that, that away and maybe, maybe, maybe this is the first one which has, has uh, uh, the same quantum numbers. So you can improve the convergence a lot, typically, if you build in all the quantum numbers that you can. <clears throat> so let me talk about how you can make a state which has, has zero momentum there. Okay, so those are uh, what we call amplitude product states. These were introduced a long time ago by Phil Anderson and collaborators. So basically, uh, an amplitude product state is just, you know, these valence bonds states that we have talked about, weighted by a product of amplitudes. And so then amplitudes, amplitudes are positive numbers, <clears throat> and they basically are associated with the length of the bond, or I could say the shape of the bond. So each, if I have a, you know, shortest bond that has one amplitude associated with it, and the one shown here, has another one. So all shapes of bonds have, uh, meaning the x and y uh, lengths that those define the shape, have some weights associated with them, some amplitudes. Uh, so the wave function coefficient of that state is just the product of the amplitudes on all these, uh, of all these bonds, which then depends on what the configuration is, of course. And uh, often when we work with these, we will uh, actually uh, use the length of the bond as something that uh, decides what the amplitude is. But you, in principle, it depends on the whole shape. So now one can actually say that, okay, the uh, trial state is such a superposition, and that is actually a state which has zero momentum. You can actually easily see that, because if you translate it, uh, it's identical, and uh, there will be no uh, factor in front of it. So that means that uh, 
uh, momentum is zero. This is a completely translationally invariant state. <coughs> okay, so then there's some simple, you know, bond reconfigurations one can do and do, a, you know, Monte Carlo, Metropolis, accept, reject, step with those. So in addition to sampling those operators, we can also sample these uh, trial states and in that way ensure that the momentum is zero. Uh, it turns out that there's actually some more efficient way to sample these two. One can make some kind of loop updates there too, but le let me not talk about that. This is actually quite sufficient for, for, for sampling these. <clears throat> okay, so the only difference from before is that instead of just a fixed state here, we have this superposition, which could be of, of this kind uh, that we also sample. So, so also these states will be be changed in the course of, of this. <clears throat> so in principle, what we want to do actually is to uh, use some amplitudes, uh, maybe parameterize them in some way. I mean, there are lots of amplitudes. So maybe so in terms of variational parameters, you have a lot of variational parameters. So maybe you want to simplify it. For example, uh, what was done in this original paper by Anderson and collaborators, they basically said that H of X, Y is just H of R, X, Y, where this is just uh, uh, the length of the bond. And they said, okay, let's try something. So they tried, uh, you know, this is some power law of X, Y, and then they could try what power was the best or they could try some exponential uh, exponential form and so on. <clears throat> so they, they played around with, with, with such states. Uh, so in principle, what one could do is to do a variational calculation to optimize these states uh, and then improve that state you know, to perfection by projection. Uh, okay. So, so that, that, that's one thing one can do. But as I already mentioned, it's not so critical what you actually use. But I would say at least use a state which has translational symmetry, meaning it has, in this basis, zero momentum. <clears throat> because that has the advantage of uh, throwing out some other momentum states from the outset. Actually, let me, let me show you some, some properties of, of, of such states. So, so it was Phil Anderson and collaborators, they first used some parameterization of the amplitudes like that. What we decided to do several years ago with a former student was to really optimize all the amplitudes. So we have H of X, X, Y, and we don't know what they are. <clears throat> we can, of course, just say that, okay, H for the shortest one is one as a sort of normalization. That doesn't matter. Uh, none of the normalizations matter here. Uh, and then we can uh, optimize all, all the other ones uh, by some variational Monte Carlo methods. Let me not discuss exactly what we did just to show the results. So if we just focus on the energy as a function of system size, so the black dots here show the, variation, the best variational energy that we could get. Uh, and then what we did, we did this projection out of that state to basically get the exact energy after that, and so this is the exact energy. Uh, but you can see that, well, there's a clear gap there, but if you look at the scale here, these are actually very good variational states. So the energy is better than 0.1%, uh, which <clears throat> for most people who do variational calculations, that would be considered really a great uh, state. But one should always take such things with a grain of salt because even if uh, the energy is good, in principle, other properties don't need to be good. But it turns out that even the, the correlation functions in this case are uh, actually this is the sublattice magnetization squared. <clears throat> uh, you can see even that agrees very well between the projected and the uh, variational state. And uh, you see that the variational curve is not completely smooth here. Also here it's not completely smooth, but it looks a little bit better. 
And that's because it's actually not easy to completely optimize these uh, amplitudes. So in, in some cases, the states we have are not perfectly optimized. But still, it looks quite good. <clears throat> so these, these valence bond states themselves can actually be really good variational states, if you are interested in such things. <clears throat> And then what we did in our work, we also looked at, well, when we have optimized these bonds, uh, uh, how do they depend on the length of the bond? I mean, uh, Phil Anderson and collaborators, they concluded that some power law was, seemed to be a, the best variational state. But if we don't even assume that form, we actually still got a power law. So here I just show the bond length, uh, bond amplitude for the longest bond in the system, and it decays pretty much like 1 over L cubed, <coughs> uh, corresponding to 1 over R cubed, which actually one, one can derive in some sort of mean field way, which I will not talk about, but uh, one can actually do it. Okay, so that was about uh, 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 the states and, and the basic project or scheme. But I already mentioned that this projection scheme that I talked about so far wasn't that, that great, actually. So a few years ago, uh, with Hans Evers, we realized that actually these loop updates that we had already used uh, a long time for SSC, which actually build on the previous work by Evers and collaborators, <clears throat> those can actually be very easily adapted to the, this scheme as well. Uh, and it, it's actually amazing how simple it is. So this is the kind of pictures I showed you before. We have uh, the bonds. You don't see the spins anywhere because the bonds just mean up, down, minus, down, up. <clears throat> but now what we can actually do is to put the spins back in. So on each bond, we have down, up, or up, down. Right? And the, it's the same probability for both. So we can just choose one. So on each... In, in the starting state and uh, later on also, we just pick one of the possibilities. And then we get pictures that look essentially the same or very close to what I, we did in the SSC. OK, now what I should have done is to take this picture and, and, and convert it. But unfortunately, I, I have uh, not done that. So I just show another picture for a smaller configuration. <clears throat> so this is a, a configuration with just four spins. What happened now? Oh, I should connect my power supply, I think. Just Normally, I'm fine without using the power supply, but this was a bit longer than normally. So. Let's see. Where, where is an outlet here? It's on the table. Oh, yeah, of course. It's so close, I didn't even see. <clears throat> okay, we are saved. Uh, okay, yes, yeah, so I show a smaller configuration, but, but here I still keep the valence bonds of the uh, trial state in one configuration of the trial state. But now you see I put, on, put in the spin. So here black and white is up, up and down. Okay. Uh, and then you see when I, now again, if I, if I look at uh, what happens, you know, during the projection, since I have now chosen you know, one component of the singlet, then the operators, which here are the full singlet projectors, they effectively, effectively only the diagonal or the off-diagonal operator can work when I put, put it all together. So, so, so basically, it, it, it uh, becomes like, like in, in the SSC case with these vertices, except that here we don't have periodic boundaries. So in, in SSC, we had, you know, periodic boundaries and there were no bonds here. <clears throat> now instead, these bonds actually act like parts of these loops, because now we can again build loops here. Uh, and the loops, when they hit the end state here, the 
valence bond is like a continuation of the loop. And that's natural because if we flip spins along the loop, if we flip this spin, well, in the valence bond, the other spin also has to be flipped. So it, it becomes a natural continuation of the loop. So the loop up updates will now also sample the spins uh, of, of the initial state as they did before. We still have to do, uh, if we sample the you know, uh, trial state, we have to do some bond uh, swaps in, in these trial state, but that's also very, very easy. One can just uh, you know, reconfigure two bonds as before, just make sure that the spin configuration is compatible with, with what you put in. <clears throat> so now we can actually, uh, what, what we then do is, uh, uh, is, as I say in the last line here, we sample the configurations using the spins, but uh, when it comes to measuring some observables, then we just go back to this picture where we just say, okay, now these are singlets and these are the full singlet projectors, and then we just uh, get those uh, transition graph loops and we measure in them. <clears throat> so, so basically what, what this becomes then is it's just, a, uh, in some sense, when we do the sampling, the only thing that is left of the valence bond picture is in the trial state. So it's just that the trial state is a valence bond state, but we express that valence bond state in terms of the normal basis, and then everything becomes like basically an SSE, except uh, for this boundary condition. <clears throat> uh, and this is again very efficient, uh, much more efficient than, than uh, before. Okay, so here I show some sort of animations that was made by my former uh, PhD student, Ying Tang. Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay, so that's the, the shape of the loop is given by the location of these operators. So, okay, so I forget to say one thing. In, in SSC, we insert and remove diagonal operators, right? <clears throat> and that's because um, uh, we sample the Taylor expansion, so the number of operators should fluctuate. Here we always have a fixed number of operators. So the only thing we do is move the operators. So I may move this operator from here to here. Uh, and that's done exactly like you do in a diagonal update in SSE. You start with this state, just propagate the state, and um, uh, then instead of inserting and removing an operator, a diagonal operator can be, can be moved. And where the operators are will exactly determine the loop structure. <clears throat> so after you have done those diagonal updates, uh, you just look for the loops. You, you don't decide where the loops are. The structure is just there. You just find it by, by this deterministic rule. You just go in, in this list. No, so the only thing you have to do is you have to again, store the kind of structure we had last time. Maybe it's easier if I actually jump back to what we had in the last lecture, because it's really almost the same. Um, so this is what we had <clears throat> last time. This is the kind of uh, loop structure we had then. So if it was clear for you in this picture, then it's exactly the same now. It's just that. Uh, in the projector method, these states are not the same. Instead, they have some bonds connected to them, <clears throat> and those bonds will act as a continuation of a loop. So if a loop goes you know, out to that state, there's a continuation, maybe it's connected to that one, and so on. So, so the structure of the loops is just decided by where these operators are lo located, and that is decided at random at the diagonal update. I know it can seem a bit confusing because this is going quite fast, but in the end, this is very simple. As you can see, if you look at these programs and these pseudo codes that I have, how compact everything is. Uh, and it, it's really, uh, you know, conceptually quite simple when you, when you understand it. But when you first see it, I, I know it can, can feel a bit confusing. So even if you don't understand the detail here, the point I want to make <clears throat> is that now this projector method is 
ex almost exactly the same as the finite temperature. And we can actually, well, I will put them side by side in a mom moment. Let me just show you this animation that my former student made. So now she's, so this may answer your question. So this is now showing, the, you saw that it was just an empty, empty thing. These spin states are shown there just for reference. So when we started, there was just these valence bonds there, and you have chosen up, down, or down, up on the bonds on both sides. And you saw that everything was empty. And now we just put in some diagonal operators. So these are now the diagonal parts of the sing singlet projectors, but it's just exactly like the diagonal part in SSE. Okay? So this was the first step of the simulation was done here. Okay? Now comes the next step. Then we uh, uh, create these links between the vertices. Uh, and when we have, when we do that, those spins uh, on the straight segments are not even needed. So these are now really the links of, of the vertices. <clears throat> and now we see that we can think of already these bonds as, as also being links. So instead of periodic boundaries there, there are end cap states which link different sides together. Okay, now uh, Ing made the next step here. Actually, to be honest, she made these graphs for lectures I gave here like three years ago. <laughs> uh, so I'm showing the, the, the same ones now. Uh, uh, and actually she gave uh, tutorials then, uh, which, uh, you know, that's why I didn't want to do it this year because she did it for me the previous time. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm using some of her animations anyway. Uh, anyway, so now, okay, now she has created some loops here. Uh, and this is what you, again, would do in this linked vertex list. So these are, are two loops uh, and that she decided to flip. So now what happens when the loops are flipped? So when the loops are flipped, some spins changed and some operators changed. Uh, and uh, I think at that point, uh, at that point, we are done with the, Updating. So now we switch to the pure valence bond uh, propagations because now we want to measure things. So then we have the bonds, we have the bond configuration. And now we just pretend that these are the full singlet projectors. That's how it works. When you basically sum over all spin configurations, which is what we do in, in to get the valence bonds, then these become the full singlet projectors. So then we can just propagate those states and we can measure something and basically, you know, this state becomes uh, propagated into some other bond configuration and like here, and we get this transition graph uh, and its loops uh, that we can measure things on. <clears throat> and of course, uh, to get the ground state, it's important that this power, you know, the number of operators is, is uh, large enough. So that has to be, be tested. Uh, right. Uh, okay, so a bit, bit more, one other animation she, she made, really to show how this is done in, um, in the data structure you store, so, and including these bin, bit flip uh, operations. So now she's putting in here the diagonal operators, and in this representation we are using, it's a kind of binary representation. Okay, but this is just the number seven, but if we look at it in terms of its bit representation, uh, uh, I think actually now the convention is, is uh, yeah, it's like before. So the even numbers correspond to diagonal operators. So now there's all even numbers here, and, and that's why the you know, last or the first bit, the bit zero is always zero here. So this number is just the location of that operator in the ch along the chain times two, right? Okay, uh, and now uh, the links are made, so that that is done in some uh, other, other structure, uh, which is not shown here. But now uh, we make some loops, and the loops are going to be flipped. So now I want to show you what happens when you actually flip the loops. So then when you flip some loops, the operators will change. So these become, will become uh, off-diagonal operators. And that actually affects then uh, the bits of, uh, of those uh, uh, 
the, the, la the first bit because when you change the type of the operator, the number just becomes odd in the way which corresponds to changing the zero bit from zero to one. So this is what, what's actually done uh, in the program. Okay, uh, so that, that's about it. Okay, so convergence. So uh, actually, are there any other questions about these technical issues? Yes. Right. Yeah, so this is what I want to show it to you. I will show some. Uh, actually, sorry, I, I will not show that. But yeah, that's a good good question. So actually, uh, how is beta and this m related to each other? So we can get that from what we what we did uh, did um, last lecture. So in the last lecture, I told you, for example, that the energy, let's say, absolute value of the ground state. Well, let, let's say we go to really low temperature now, so we have the ground state is uh, n divided by by beta. So that means n is basically, let's say, n times beta, because the energy is extensive. Okay. Uh, so, so that's where this distribution is, is peak, right? So we have n and probability of n, and it's some something that looks a Gaussian, right, like that, but it's it's some kind of Poisson distribution. So this average n uh, is is proportional to n times beta. So. Uh, that's why we, okay, so now, okay, what, what, what do you need to be, beta to be? Okay, beta is one over the temperature. Uh, and the temperature should be much less than the gap if you want to get to the ground state. So now, of course, then it depends on what, what the gap is in the system. Uh, but, you know, now we are not working with uh, the exponential, so you know, we could work with e to the minus beta h, or we work with h to the m. Now we work with h to the m, but but this shows shows how these should be related. So if if uh, if this is what we need, so let's say we have figured out roughly what beta we need, and we know what the system size is, then we know that if we do the exponential projection, <coughs> uh, the the contributing power will be you know, proportional to n times beta. So that means that the m that we should use, if we just use a power of m, should also be of that order. Because really, you know, if you do the exponential, this power is fluctuating a little bit, but you know, the width of this distribution is square root of n. So you know, square root of n divided by n is 1 over square root of n. So basically, the fluctuations should become essentially unimportant. So, so there, there, there should be no real difference in doing the power of h or the exponential. And this is basically uh, how we relate the two. On the same order, the same order except <clears throat> what I told you before, that effectively we may see a different gap. Because if we do finite temperature, that we will see the, the very smallest gap in the system, which is typically a singlet to triplet gap. But if we do uh, the valence bond basis, the smallest gap we see is the singlet to singlet gap, which is higher. So, so this should, uh, this scheme should converge faster because, you know, instead of, you know, T having to be much less than uh, delta triplet, we have T has to be much less than delta singlet, and which is larger than delta triplet. Right. So, and you know, maybe the momentum can play some uh, role as well here, because we throw out some higher momentum states. So, uh, the experience is that that it converge, converges a little bit better, but it's normally not you know, many orders of magnitude, but maybe you can gain a factor of two or three or something. But it really depends on what is the difference between the singlet and triplet gap. 
Okay, so I'm supposed to go on until noon, right? Until 12, yeah. Okay, so, but let's look at, at the convergence a, a little bit. So I will not compare, I have some graphs actually, I, I could have brought those where I compare with uh, the temperature uh, case and you can see how, how it's better, but I don't have that here. But here I will uh, at least show you the effect of the trial state. Uh, so let, let's actually discuss exactly the convergence a little bit more. Uh, so this is the trial state, and if I project with the m mth power, this is what I get. So I can write some expectation value of some uh, operator in this way. I get the ground state expectation value, and then I get various contributions from the excited states, and the leading one uh, will be like this. So if I do with the power, again, it's, I, can, I can write this as uh, uh, in terms of a ratio of... Uh, uh, of the energies, and actually, if uh, if I use the gap here, I say that okay, the gap is e1 minus e0, uh, then I can replace e1 with e0 plus the gap. <clears throat> Since the gap, at least for a big system, is much much smaller than the energy itself, uh, that can be approximated with an exponential. So that's also how one can relate these two in, 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 a, in a different way than looking at the distribution. So basically, you can say that uh, the correction is basically an exponential that de depends on the gap, but this m is also here, and okay, n times e naught, so this is just the total energy. Uh, so it converges exponentially with m eventually, and it depends on, on the gap. Uh, so that then the conclusion is again similar to what I said there, but expressed a little bit differently, that you should always consider m in relation to the system size. And this is, you know, the same as, as it said here as well. <clears throat> so when you, in your program, it's better if you want to read in what m should be. It's better to say, that, okay, m is some multiple of the system size, and what is that multiple? So m divided by n should be much larger than, you know, the normalized, size normalized ground state energy, which is, you know, the, the one which converges when the size goes to infinity, divided by, by delta. Uh, so a small gap, for a small gap you need larger m. Uh, and again, it, it should be the singlet, singlet gap. And we already discussed the moment and so on. But okay, here I show you some, some examples. And this is for uh, 32 by 32. So, you know, mod moderately large 2D Heisenberg system. Uh, let's look at the energy first. And here you see I show many curves. And what are they? <clears throat> well, these are using as trial states the amplitude product states where I just use a power law. So the uh, amplitudes decay exactly in this form. Uh, as a function of the length of, of the bond uh, with the power 2, 3, and 4. Uh, so that we can look at those first. So 2 is the black one. Uh, and if you go to 4, it becomes worse. If you go to 3, it's uh, better. So uh, 3 is, is the best power out of, out of these three. Uh, but then what you can also do, which I mentioned, we can optimize uh, variationally these states and use uh, that as the starting point, and that should be better, right? <clears throat> and then I did it twice because, uh, as I also mentioned, it's not completely easy to completely optimize them. So they are never completely optimized. I just wanted to compare two cases, uh, how close to each other they are. And actually, interestingly, these energies, okay, they're much better, but they're very close to each other. But if I look at the sublattice magnetization squared, there's a big difference between those states that I optimized. Although they have almost the same energy, you can still see differences in initially in, in the spin correlations. But then, of course, everything converges as a function of m here divided by n. Uh, uh, but, okay, you can see that it does help to have a well-optimized state, but eventually even poor states converge to the correct result. 
and uh, you know, by the way, the, these results are the correct results to you know very high precision as one can get from SSC or well, there's no even even reason to doubt this, but of course one can compare with SSC. Okay, let me actually are there some questions about the convergence or anything like that? Any more questions? Okay, so let me say a few words about frustrated systems. Why why this doesn't work? So if we do uh, the valence bond basis, I always talked about the bonds connecting A and B sides of a bipartite lattice, right? So in principle, one can also consider a more, uh, a bit even larger basis where you can have bonds also between A, A and B, B sides. <clears throat> That's perfectly fine. It, it's even more massively overcomplete, but it has very similar properties and so on. Uh, so I can call these frustrated bonds. Now, if you consider a basis with such frustrated bonds, but the Hamiltonian is bipartite, when you do this kind of projection, then these bonds actually will go away. So, because, for example, if you act on sites B and C on such a configuration, uh, then you just get a you know, configuration with normal bonds. And you can also see if you act on normal bonds, you don't get the frustrated bonds. <clears throat> so basically, in a bipartite system, this kind of basis can be used, but in the projection, it will go back to the normal basis anyway. <clears throat> but if you have a frustrated system, these uh, frustrating bonds will not go away, and they will actually be associated with uh, sign problems. Uh, when you consider the overlaps and so on, the properties are not as, as nice as before. There are some signs coming in. But you can still eliminate these bonds, actually. Uh, so in, if you have a frustrated system, you will always create such bonds because you act you know, between AA and BB sites. For example, if you have uh, interactions on these diagonals, you will clearly project bonds on, on the diagonals. <clears throat> but there are some relations between bonds having to do with the overcompleteness. So this bond configuration is equivalent to the sum of these two or difference between those two. And actually, that's exactly why this in the end doesn't help, because if you want to always, when you have done an operation, you can go back to the normal bonds. You can choose which one, but you have a sign there. So that sign is the manifestation of the sign problem uh, in this basis. So people have tried quite hard to uh, overcome these problems for frustrated systems with valence bonds. And there's a little bit of progress, but not, not, nothing really uh, that has, has helped us really solve the systems. <clears throat> Let's see. I think I still have time to talk about. OK, let me talk a, a little bit about valence bond solid states. So VBS means valence bond solid states, and this will take me also into talking about spin-ons in a moment. Uh, so I have already talked about the Heisenberg interaction as a singlet projector, so I don't need to uh, repeat that. So the Heisenberg model is basically a sum of singlet projectors. Um, we can actually make some extended models with products of singlet projectors. So if I denote a singlet projector by a red uh, uh, bar like this, then my J exchange interaction is just a singlet projector. I can consider interactions that are products of such singlet projectors. For example, here I just show it on a chain. In this first paper here, this was done in, uh, in two dimensions, but here I will just discuss the one-dimensional case. <clears throat> so I can consider two or even a product of three or even more. Uh, so in a formal, I can write the Hamiltonian like this. Uh, the, this is the Heisenberg interaction. And then I call this one the next one Q, which is the product of two singlet projectors. Um, and I can let those appear anywhere. So I, I sum over all translations of not only J, but Q as well. Uh, and it turns out that although these models are not frustrated in the conventional sense, there are actually no sign problems if we study them, if you have a minus sign here. Uh, but interestingly, they have some similar properties as uh, frustrated systems. 
Uh, so, well, that may be a controversial statement still in two dimensions, although I definitely believe it's true. But in one dimension, it, it, it should not be controversial anymore. So, <clears throat> in, uh, uh, I will talk a little bit about the J1, J2 Heisenberg chain, and uh, this kind of model actually has the same kind of, of phase transition and, and phases. Uh, and I should say that the methods we have discussed can very easily be adapted to, to these interactions as well. Okay, so the frustrated Heisenberg chain, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. We can consider it as having uh, next nearest neighbor interactions like that. Or you can consider it as a kind of ladder where uh, J2 is the interaction in the ladder and J1 is between the ladders. That's completely equivalent. I normally prefer to look at it in that way. Uh, and then as you change the ratio of these two couplings, and I will consider both of them ferromagnetics, that, uh, sorry, antiferromagnetics, that means the system is frustrated geometrically, uh, there are different phases. So just the most important phases and phase transitions, uh, which is the only thing I will talk about here, is that if you turn the ratio to about about 24, you get a special point where for values smaller than that, you had basically the same kind of state as you have in the Heisenberg chain, meaning you have some spin correlation functions that decay algebraically. <clears throat> as I mentioned from the Mermin-Wagner theorem, you cannot have long range order in, in 1D in this case. So you have in, instead what you have is some critical quasi ordered state. And there are gapless spin on excitations and so on. That's well known. If you go to this point here, then the ground state changes actually to a valence bond solid. So there are, there's actually one point when G is one half where the ground state can be solved exactly. And there are two ground states, and there are exactly uh, the ones where you have singlets. So this means singlet. You have singlets on alternating bonds. <clears throat> and um, if you are away from that point, but you are larger than 0.24 or something like that, then you still have valence bond solid order in the system, although it's not maximally ordered as here. It has some fluctuations. Uh, so this is well known for this J1, J2 chain, and it turns out that uh, uh, this JQ chain has actually exactly the same uh, phases as well. So there's a critical Heisenberg type state and then there's a valence bond solid state here uh, for both the Q2 and Q3 interaction. <clears throat> and okay, to characterize such states, um, we should actually measure some bond strengths and so on. Let me not talk so much about that. But basically, we can measure some four spin correlations to detect that kind of order. And those four spin correlations can also be uh, related to those transition graphs that I talked about. <clears throat> yeah. So it would be in this sense the phase of the small Q system? Oh, yeah. So, you know, just the Heisenberg chain has uh, a critical state where the spin correlations decay in this fashion. So that, that's a critical state. Now, if you take this model, uh, if G is small, the system stays in that critical state. So it's, so you know that Heisenberg chain at J2 is zero. It's not a critical point that you immediately destroy. It's a whole critical phase. It's similar to costelitz Stauler's kind of thing, actually. Uh, but but you have exactly the same form of the spin correlation functions. Uh, actually, an interesting point is that you see that there are these log log corrections to the spin correlation function. So what happens at this critical point is actually that the log corrections go away, and then after that you get the VBS. So in, uh, there's a field theory description of this too, and it's described by this weiss zumino witten field theory. And uh, what happens is that there's a marginal operator which changes sign here. So the marginal operator is, is marginally uh, irrelevant, and it causes these log corrections. And uh, here it, it, it's, uh, it's zero, and, and here it's marginally relevant and causes the VBS. 
So, uh, so, so that we can also study with these uh, JQ models. Uh, uh, but now, now, okay, so we can, you know, simulate those states and measure things. Now I just want to show an animation again. Ing made this animation. So this is an animation. Uh, it's actually showing the imaginary time or, or, or this propagation in the time direction. You start from, uh, or I think it's only close to, close to the center of the system. But anyway, so it's basically showing the bond fluctuations in the ground state. You can think of it like that. So the bra and the cat are shown, you know, in one outside the circle and one, one inside. So you see, this is for the pure Q model. I think it's the, what we call the Q3 model. So this has clearly a very strong valence bond solid order. You can see that it's completely ordered with just some small quantum fluctuations of that order. But now I can uh, change the value. So now I put in some more J interaction, <clears throat> and then you see that uh, uh, actually this may be the transition graph loops. I, I should actually remember what it is. So it may be as a function of simulation time or something like that. It, it doesn't really matter as a function of what. In, in either case, it's showing the ground state transition graph loops. Okay, so you see that there are some more long bonds now, but still order. And now I go to where the critical point is, and then you have a lot of fluctuations, and now actually the order is gone. So now uh, there should be power law, dimer dimer correlations at this point if we, if we were to measure them. <clears throat> so it's hard to see here, but if you see that there are still some segments of ordered bonds, but then there's some gaps and phase shifts and things like that. So so there's no long range order in this system anymore. Okay, and you see sometimes you get some really long bonds. Okay, uh, now let me talk about spin-ons a little bit. And for that I need to talk about uh, extended valence bond, the extended valence bond basis. So we discussed it for singlet states. Now we, we want to look at, at higher spin states. So let, let's consider states which have a magnetization equal to the spin. So to be specific, let's consider a spin one state where the magnet Z component is also one. So then in the valence bond basis, what we can do, we can pair up all spins as before, except we leave two up spins unpaired. So then it turns out that the total spin of that state, as you can intuitively see, <clears throat> is is one as well. So this is for, for general S here. Uh, okay. So so here are some examples. So this is what we already did. This is just for six spins on a chain, a transition graph for uh, the valence bonds of a s uh, singlet. If you have an odd number of spins, you can also look at one unpaired spin, so then the spin is one half. And then you see that the transition graph has an open an open loop, a string. <clears throat> so one unpaired, there's one unpaired spin, but it can be in a different location in the bra and the cat. And those locations are connected by, by a string. So now we don't have just loops to worry about, we have loops and strings. But it's, it's a very easy generalization. If we have spin one, we have two unpaired spins. Uh, and they are actually always on, on different sublattices. <clears throat> so that's what open and solid means here. Uh, but again, they are in different locations in the bra and, and the cat. So here, oops, oops. Uh, so here, um, uh, in this case, the, there is no string. They are on the same side. And here, that's the string. So intuitively, this has something to do with the spin-ons now. Spin-ons are... Uh, objects with spin one half, right? Uh, and one question people have in, in many systems is whether those spin-ons are really the elementary excitations. <clears throat> so for example, if in uh, neutron scattering, as Bella Lake has done, uh, if you excite a, a spin one half chain by a neutron, you excite a magnon which has spin one, but that actually uh, 
decays into two spinons, and you can actually uh, see signatures of that in neutron scattering. Here we can actually look at that more directly, because these basically are the spinons. But it's not only the unpaired spin, it's actually this whole string is representing the spinon. <clears throat> so by basically looking at the statistics of strings, we can say something about spinons. Okay, and the only thing I will do is to show you some animations again. Uh, so this is deep in a valence bond solid, just for illustration. So this is basically a spin one half state. So there's one spin on, but it's in a different location in the bra and the cat. And it's hard to see here because it's moving around, but they are connected by, by a string. <clears throat> uh, but you see here that they stay close to each other. And that actually can be interpreted as the spin on having a well-defined size. So the size of the spin on is not just one unpaired spin. It's actually some sort of average distance between, between those guys. OK. In 1D, whether it's a critical state or valence bond solid state, uh, we will have spin on deconfinement, meaning that the spin ons are not bound to each other. And that you see here, if we put in two spin ons, again, this one version in the bra and in the cat. But you see that those stay close to each other, and those stay close to each other, but, but they go far away from each other. So basically, they don't interact with each other. <clears throat> so, so this is a manifestation of spin on deconfinement in, in the valence bond solid. Uh, and OK, this is pretty much all I wanted to do. So this just gave you a little bit flavor of what you can do in the valence bond basis. And in particular, looking at spin ons is something quite uh, recent that we are working quite, quite a lot on these days, but in two dimensions. Uh, okay, so let me just mention, uh, again, there's a code. Uh, I didn't show any pseudocodes now, but actually everything is quite similar to uh, the SSE. Uh, and I have codes here, and at least there are some comments uh, in the code. And I think you will see how similar they are. <clears throat> of course, in this, this case, there are some extra elements that have to do with the bonds and so on, but it's, it's not much more difficult. Okay, so I guess I can stop there and take some questions.